Amen. Well, good morning, everyone, once again. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of 2 Timothy today. You know, as you're making your way there, you know, we were all obviously shocked yesterday with uh, the shooting of former President Trump. Just an unbelievable thing to see. I don't think we've seen something like that since I was a kid when Reagan got shot. And, and, uh, and I remember that. But uh, it was just such a sad, difficult thing to, to watch unfold. And, and I know we're all upset about that, or at least we all should be. You know, love him or hate him as far as Trump goes, or Democrat, Republican. I mean, we don't want to live in a society like that. And uh, it's disturbing. And I'm not going to preach on that today, just in case you were wondering. But, uh, um, you know, we're getting our heads filled with it right now. But we will tonight, we have a deacon-led prayer meeting tonight at 4 o'clock before our 5 o'clock service. And if you want to come and pray, we'll be praying for our country at that meeting. But today we're going to be continuing in our series through the letters of Paul to Timothy. And we're in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And the subject today is, is facing fears. Paul and Timothy both had to face overwhelming fear as they were attempting to live their faith in a very hostile world in their day. Paul was actually in prison in Rome when he wrote this letter to Timothy. So the, the fears that were there were very real. I mean, he was actually in prison. And the truth is we all have to face fear if we're going to walk in faith in this world. We have to face fear of rejection, fears of, of failure, you know, fears of embarrassment, you know, fears of where our faith might put us if we try to walk in it. There's all kinds of fears that we face. And sometimes those fears are justified. Uh, sometimes the fears that we fear are, are not real. Sometimes we just get caught up and we fear things that we, we think might happen. And that's really the subject of a lot of our fears. Julius Caesar wrote in his book, Commentaries, where he wrote about his military campaigns in Gaul. But he wrote this, he had a passage and he said this, generally all evils which are distant most powerfully alarm men's minds. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. It's a reality. You know, some of the worst fears that we face are not what we're facing right now, but what we think might be coming. We start thinking about what it is actually going to cost us if we follow Christ in a genuine way. This is a very real fear for Christians. If I follow the scripture, if I do what God's word tells me to do, it's going to put me in positions that's going to make things very difficult for me, very awkward. And we start thinking about what those possibilities might be and we have fear in our hearts. You know, to be a disciple of Christ, to actually live the Christian life according to the Bible, it guarantees that we're going to experience some level of persecution and hate from the world. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble, but fear not, I have overcome the world. You know, the persecution that we face, it's not what the Apostle Paul, we're not being thrown into prison right now. We face trials, ridicule maybe, persecution in some cases, but that's part of the Christian life. Paul addressed this epistle to Timothy. Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Timothy held a very dangerous position at this point in time in history. And because of the nature of this epistle, it seems as though Timothy may have been buckling a little bit under the pressure, or Paul was at least worried that he would. Timothy saw that Paul was in prison, so he started counting the cost in his own life, as any of us would. And it would, the question would come up, is it really worth it? Is it really worth putting myself and allowing myself to be put into prison to preach the gospel. And Paul, who's already in prison, he writes this letter to encourage Timothy to not go underground with his faith. Paul says in verse 3 of chapter 1, I'm praying for you without ceasing. And then he reminds Timothy of his commitment to Christ. In verse 5, he says, I have joy in remembering the genuine faith that is in you. And so as though he's saying, Timothy, I know that you have fears and pressure. I know that you're facing dangers from outside the church. You're facing dissensions from inside the church. I'm praying for you that you will face your fears. That's what our passage is about today. How can we face our fears and overcome them? 
Paul tells us what we need to do when we're facing fears in this passage. Number one is this. He says to stir up the gift of God. All right, so verse six. Paul says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So as we're facing fears in our life, this is the first thing Paul tells us to do, to stir up the gift of God. He says, Timothy, let me remind you to stir up the gift. He's saying, do not hide your faith, Timothy. You know, do, not, do not leave those spiritual gifts that God has given to you, those gifts that God has put into you, don't leave them dormant in your life because you're afraid. In verse 7, Paul said, Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now that word used for fear there, that Greek word, it's used only here in the New Testament. It's very common in, in Greek literature. But it's a word that carries with it a negative connotation. It meant specifically timid. Don't be timid or cowardly. It refers to cowardice. Paul says, Timothy, if you are being timid, if you're living like a coward, that is not the spirit of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear. And Chris, I would say this to you today. God has not given you a spirit of fear. There's a spirit of power, of love, of a sound mind. That's the gift of God to Timothy. That's the gift of God to all of us. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is saying, Timothy, I remind you to stir up that gift that God has given you. And it's not the spirit of fear. See, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives brings with it, it's inside of us, the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind, not fear. So Paul knew that Timothy was, was fearful. He was overwhelmed, unprepared. Maybe he was a little depressed. So he says, Timothy, stir up the gift of God. That is, fan it to a flame, rekindle it, light it up again. You see, his flame was starting to go out. You know, what are some of the things that caused the flame, you know, that, that burning Holy Spirit that we once had in our Christian wall, and yet it's kind of filtered out. It's kind of gone down. What are some of the things that caused the flame to go out? You know, there's so many. You know, just being in the world, the distractions of the world. We are so covered in the time in which we live by distractions, worldly entertainments. Sin is always in our face and consuming us. Unlike, and I mean this, unlike any other generation, we have to deal with more distractions than any other generation. And sin is always in front of our faces. And the more consumed we are by all the stuff of the world, the more we will grow lax in our convictions about sin in our life, the more sin will allow in. And as a result of that, the more fear that will grow in our life. And the gift that God has given us it will be diminished because we allow fear to overwhelm us. We allow the world to overwhelm us. The fire of the Holy Spirit that once burned in us and drove us to faith and good works, he's distanced from our hearts and minds because of fear and sin. Paul says, stir it up again. Fan the flame of the Holy Spirit. You're either going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and moved by him, or you are going to be moved to suppress the convictions of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the two ways that any of us are going to go as Christians. You must stir up the gift of God or it's going to diminish. Paul says in verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. You see, a spirit of fear comes from the flesh. It's a spirit of cowardice. And that's not the spirit that God has given to us. Christ makes men fearless. That's the result of Christ in a woman's life. It makes a woman fearless. That's the gift that God has put, in, put into us. But it's the flesh that makes us afraid. It's the world. So fear comes from a lack of faith. It comes from a lack of trust in God. It comes from getting overwhelmed with the world. Just like the servant in the parable of the talents. Jesus is the one that gave us that parable. He gave that servant a talent, and the master wanted him to go and make good with it. What did he do? He buried it. And why did he bury it? Because he was afraid. And whenever he was called to account for it, he said, I was afraid. I knew you were tough. I didn't want to lose it. And the master said, that is a wicked servant. 
When we bury our talent, when you bury your faith, when you hide your faith out of fear, you're being a wicked servant, according to Jesus. Paul says, stir it up. Stir up the gift of God. You know, the only thing that causes us to fear really is an evil conscience, our own evil conscience. We know we have sin in our lives, and that sin, if we're not willing to get rid of it, if we're not willing to turn from it, it develops into fear, and it causes us to hide our faith. But we're supposed to walk in the Spirit. Because the gift that God has put in us is a spirit of power. It's in us. Don't let it just lie there dormant. It has to be stirred up. We have to walk in the Spirit. We have to turn away from the world. If the Spirit of God is in us, what can we possibly fear? I'll tell you this. You'll never experience the power of the Holy Spirit in you unless you as a Christian, you recognize the power that you have within you and you start saying no to the world. That's, where, that's what so many Christians are missing. We don't say no. There's influences in our life. There's things that come against us. There's friends that come in and they try to influence away from the gospel. You're supposed to say no. And you have the power of the living God who created the heavens and the earth within you. But we forget. You see, our flesh, if we're living in the flesh, we forget. You see, fear also makes us say yes to the world. Fear of rejection makes us say yes. When our friends want us to sin, fear makes us say yes. When we're dating that boy or we're dating that girl and they want us to engage in activity that only belongs to a married couple, fear makes us say yes. Christian, we, are, we have to stir up the gift of God. The Holy Spirit has given you power to say no, to stand for the truth. What do you have to fear? If, if it's God that is in you, what do you have to fear if you're in that ungodly relationship? What do you have to fear? God knows your heart's desire. He'll make it better. He'll bring someone new. You know, the Spirit of God gives to His children. It's not a fearful spirit, but it's a courageous spirit. It's a spirit of power. They speak in His name. The one, the, we're speaking the name of Christ, the one who created heaven and earth. We have that spirit of power within us, a spirit of love, a spirit of a sound mind. Now that word, a sound mind, it means a, a spirit of self-control. The spirit of self-control is in you, but you have to stir it up. You know, the, the truth is there's many of us who struggle with self-control and it hampers our faith. It keeps us from being able to progress in our faith because we can't control ourselves. But according to this passage, it's a gift that God has deposited into us through the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit of self-control, but you have to stir that up. Rather than walking in the flesh, you have to walk in the Spirit. And there's many of us who struggle in this area of our lives. We cry out to God before we do the wrong. And then we cry out to God, and we're in this repetitive cycle. We cry out to God after we do what is wrong. Many of us were so far into this sin we cry out to God before we commit the sin that we know we're going to commit. And then when we commit it on the backside, we feel horrible about ourselves. We beat ourselves up and we say how terrible we are. Why do I do the things that I hate? As if, that's the, if that's what you're in, if that's the cycle you're in today. I can tell you, there's only one way to be delivered from that. There's only one means of gaining self-control. You must stir up the gift of God that is in you. The gift of self-control, it's lying there dormant. You have to turn away from the things of the flesh and you have to start walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and in self-control. It must be the Holy Spirit of God working in you or it's not gonna work. You must yield yourself to him. You submit yourself to the truth. You know, the only conquest that you need to make today is the conquest of yourself. So you have the spirit of the sound mind in you. It's a gift of God. You don't need to go, you don't need to go searching for some, some new revelation. You don't need to read some new book. Nothing wrong against reading books. There's not some new religion out there. There's not some new meditation. 
No, the gift is in you. If you're a born-again Christian, just stir up what is already in you. Paul said to Timothy in his first letter in chapter 4, 1 Timothy, he said, do not neglect the gift that is in you. Then in our passage here, he says, now, now he says, stir it up, fan it into a flame. And understand this, the Holy Spirit does not leave us when we fail. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you were saved, when you called upon Jesus to save you, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. So this gift of the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Paul's telling us how to face our fears. He says, stir up the gift of God. Number two, he says, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Look at verse eight. He says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Does he want to face fears in your life? Do not be ashamed of the gospel. This is what Paul says to Timothy in verse 8. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord or of me as prisoner. Now down in verses 15 and 16, we're not going to read those verses, but Paul indicates that there were some leaders in the church, Christian men in the church, after Paul was imprisoned, they abandoned him. They left him. And Paul was clearly hurt by that. These men, they were fearful about their place in society. They saw there Paul was in prison in Rome. They counted the cost for themselves. And they said to themselves, you know, I, I love this world too much to just give it up. I don't want to sacrifice all my material things to be like Paul stuck in prison in Rome. They felt a little pressure and they caved. Paul said to Timothy, do not be like those guys. Be different. Don't cave like they did. Do not be ashamed. Of Jesus. No matter what the world does to you, do not be ashamed. And that's the message for all of us today. Do not be ashamed. When you see a fellow Christian being looked down upon by the world because they're living faithfully for the Lord, do not be ashamed. When you have a friend who maybe is losing a girlfriend or a boyfriend because they don't want to live like the world, do not be ashamed. If you're dating someone, I say this to the young people, if you're dating someone and they're leading you and engaging you to live in ways that you should not live, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Take a stand for the truth. Paul says, do not be ashamed. Instead, look what he says next. He says, share with me in the suffering for the gospel. This is the answer. You're not supposed to be ashamed, and you're to be willing to suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, you might not be called on like Paul to get thrown in prison. You might just have to leave an ungodly relationship. Or you might have to break with friends who are leading you down wrong pathways. Or maybe at work, you're going to have to take a stand. Maybe it'll cost you at work because you take a stand and do what is right. You're not willing to compromise. Take your share in the suffering for the gospel. You know, Paul didn't want to suffer. He didn't want to be in prison, but he knew God had a purpose for his sacrifice. Paul wrote to the Philippians. This is what he wrote to the Philippians. He says, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it's become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, he said most of the brethren, because some of them fell away, are much more bold to speak the word without fear because of my chains. So Paul wrote that letter while he was in prison as well. Paul's commitment to Christ led to suffering, but it was his suffering that made known the gospel of Jesus Christ to the emperor of Rome, to the senators of Rome. 
It made the name of Jesus Christ famous in the world. Not only that, but Paul blazed a trail for others to follow. And because of his bravery and his perseverance, it made Christians around the world less afraid to be bold and to live their faith publicly. And there's a purpose in it. There's always a purpose for us. In any adversity that we go through, it says it right here in verse 9. Who saved us. God who saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. We have a holy calling from God. And if you will grow in a personal relationship with Christ, you will learn this about yourself. You have a holy calling from God to be different. You are God's child, his son, his daughter. And it's a holy calling. And it's to be used to winning other people to Christ. But we cannot fulfill our purpose that God has given to us according to this holy calling if we're hiding our faith, if we are ashamed. You see, our flesh wants to hide our faith. But Paul says we're to stir it up. If we're walking in the Spirit, we're going to be pushed. If we walk in the, if we stir up the Spirit, that gift that God is putting at us, if we stir it up and we start walking with the Holy Spirit, we are going to be pushed out into a dark world to be a light. Even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's difficult. You know, in the 16th century, <clears throat> in the early 1500s, you know, the Roman Catholic Church dominated infant baptism, according to Roman Catholic theology, was entrant, the entrance into the church. It was the entrance into heaven. Not by faith in Christ alone, not by confession of sin alone, but by the sprinkling of water over the head of a little infant baby. During that time, God raised up men in the church and women to speak the truth. Salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. Baptism was to be reserved for after salvation. It was a profession of faith. After, the, after salvation, it was a public testimony, the biblical mode of baptism. That was outlawed at that time. It was against the law. You could get burned at the stake. You could get drowned in a river for doing such a thing, baptizing an adult. A man named Balthazar Hubmeyer, a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, he was more than a priest. He was one of the upcoming leading academics and scholars in the Roman Catholic Church. He had a very influential uh, diocese that he was over. He was very influential in the church. He was a doctorate in theology. And he had all the promise. In fact, he was a champion for the Roman Catholic Church. And then he got his hands on a copy of the letters of Paul that he had never had before. In fact, he later lamented the fact that he became a doctor in the church without ever having read the letters of Paul for himself. Well, when he got a copy of the New Testament, he read it for himself. He translated it for himself. And he was shocked by what he discovered. He learned the truth about the nature of salvation by reading God's word. And he determined to share it with the world, even though he knew it would cost him his life. But once he learned the truth and realized the peril that the souls of people in his ministry were under, he had a choice. He could either hide it, he could hide the truth, or he could care more about the souls of lost people and speak the truth. Hugh Meyer wrote this. I want you all to hear this. He wrote this to some of his friends. He said, beloved of God, he said, I had always intended to remain alone in my barrel and cave and not at all to creep out into the light. Not that I feared the light, but in order that I might remain in peace. But God ordained it differently and has pulled me out against my will to give an account to anybody who requests it concerning my faith as it is in me. Namely, in the matter of infant baptism and the true baptism of Christ. Until now, I had hoped that someone else would have done such. Hugh says, if I had my choice, I would just stay in my cave with my books and not venture out into the light. I don't want to stir anything up. I don't want anybody to be mad at me. I don't want to get into trouble. If I had my choice, that's what I would do. But God has pulled me out against my will. Five years later, after he wrote that, five years later, Balthazar Hugh was burned alive in the city square in Vienna. His wife was watching him as he died, calling out to him to die well and for the glory of God. 
And just two days later, about 48 hours later, his wife was arrested. She was taken out into the middle of a river in a boat, a stone chained around her ankle. She was pushed overboard for her faith in Christ and their testimony and their commitment to follow God's word. You see, the Christian life, it can be difficult. Praise God, we're not at that point where we have to face that. But it's a holy calling. It's a calling of God. And we are to live that out. We are to follow that through no matter where it takes us. And we can do it in faith. We can even do it in joy. Why? Because Paul, Christ, because Christ as Paul says in verse 10, look at it. Christ has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In other words, the gospel is worth suffering for. In verse 11, Paul says, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, verse 12, for this reason I also suffer these things. For what reason? Paul is saying, because God has saved us, because he's called us with the holy calling, because Jesus has come into the world, abolished death, brought life and immortality, for these reasons I suffer. And I am not ashamed. Because Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. He's the only means of salvation. That should be the truth that's in every one of us. You too are called. You too have spiritual gifts. The gospel is worth suffering for. And your suffering might not be like Hugh Meyer and his wife. Lord willing, I'll never come to that again. What is our suffering? Discomfort? The unwillingness to say no to sin. Too many of us, I think, are ashamed of the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he's able to keep what I have committed to him. And notice what Paul does not say in verse 12 there. He does not say, I know what I have believed. That's not what he said. Of course he knows what he believes. But he didn't say that. He didn't say, I know what I have believed. You see, our, our faith is more than just intellectual knowledge. It's not enough to just say, well, I know about Jesus. I know about the death and the resurrection. Paul says, I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to keep what I have committed to him. And what is it that he committed to him? It was himself, his life, his heart, his soul, his eternity, his life in this world. He committed it all to Christ. And he believes, he is persuaded because he knows Jesus, that Jesus is able to keep and to protect and to honor what Paul had committed to him. You know, our relationship with the Lord really is transactional in a sense. There's something that we commit to him and he keeps it for us. And then there's something that he commits to us and we are to keep it. This leads us to our last point. If you want to face fear, Stir up the gift of God. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Number three, keep what God has given to you. Look at verse 13. Paul says, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Paul says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words. Keep what God has given to you. God's going to keep what you've given to him, which is your salvation. It's the up in heaven waiting on you. And now he has deposited something into you, which is the Holy Spirit of God and his word, the scripture. This word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, has been deposited into our lives, into our hearts, into our minds. And we are meant to go and share it. Paul says, keep it. Keep what God has committed to you. And he says to do it in faith and in love. You see, faith and love always go together. It's not enough to just believe the sound words, but we must love them. Believe their truth. Love their goodness. Psalm 119.97, David says, oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. <laughs> We're to love God's word. You know, we're, to, we're to love God's word. I, you know, I wonder how many of us truly love God's word in this way. If you love something, you think about it. It'd be constantly on your mind, right? I mean, think about the things that you truly love. You know, some of us, we love our cars so much. That's all we think about. 
If you have kids, you know what I mean? We love our children. We know where they are. We keep up with them. We follow them. We got them on Life 360, and we look for them. If you, hopefully you love your spouse, right? You know where your wife is, or you know where your husband is, and you want to hear from them. You want to talk to them. You keep up with the things that you truly love, and you keep up with them throughout the day. So consider for a moment. You know, in the course of a day, how many times do you think about God's word? I mean, just think about your typical day. How many times does God's word come into your heart, to your mind, some verse in the Bible? Five times? I would think that that would be rather good. Five times a day? Is it only once? Do you think about God's word at least once a day? Or is it zero? I wonder how many of us on a typical day we think about God's word zero times throughout the day. That's not keeping God's word in faith and love. That's not holding fast to the word of God in faith and love. Because if you love something, you think about it. You know, if you're not reading God's word, if you're not meditating on the scripture, if you don't spend time with the Lord meditating on his word, you don't love it. And you won't even possess it, even though God has deposited it to you. The apostle says to Timothy, hold fast the word of God and love. Hold fast, possess it, grasp onto it, love it. And he says, if you will, it will lead to strength. You see, God's word is a rock on which we stand, but you have to own it. You have to love it. Listen to Psalm 119 again, verse 129. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The entrance of your word gives light. I opened my mouth and panted for, I long for your commandments. Direct my steps by your word. That's what it looks like to love God's word. I mean, if you want to know what it really looks like, what your heart should be like when it comes to God's word and walking in the spirit, read Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. And every single word and phrase that David prayed to God in that chapter is inspired. And it tells us how we should be oriented towards the word of God. I encourage you to do that. We need to have that attitude. One that holds on to the pattern of sound words. And in verse 14, Paul says that good thing that was committed to you, keep it. So we commit our faith and hope to God and he keeps it. And then God commits his Holy Spirit and his word to you for you to keep it. And to keep it means to hold fast to it, to live by it, to stake everything on it. We are to protect it. We are to defend it. To defend it. There's never a moment that we don't know where it is. That's the gift that has been given to us. You know, the truth is we, we live in a very dark world where there is opposition. There's a world system that does not want us speaking publicly about the word of God. They don't want to hear it. That's how the world's always been. We, we live in a very unique time where there's so much public information. There's so much information flying around always. And we as Christians and as the church, our young people especially, they are under tremendous pressure to conform to the standards of the world and to water down and to change and to ignore certain passages of Scripture. Listen, don't get caught up into this lie as though you can take out Romans chapter 1 or other passages of Scripture that make you uncomfortable and that that doesn't do damage to all of God's Word. Now, we're not called on to pick and choose the parts that we'll submit to and accept. No, we're to submit to all of it. Psalm 119, again, says, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. You need to keep what God has given to you. You want to face those fears in your life and walk with the Lord and the Holy Spirit? Number one, stir up the gift of God. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then finally, keep what God has given to you. And to keep it means hold on to it. And don't let anything take it from you. Join me in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we come before you thanking you for your word today. Holy Spirit of God, you take this word. You speak to every mind, heart, and soul in this room. Every person. Everyone that's here today, you have sent here to hear this message, to hear this word. So Holy Spirit, your will be done. We give you this time of invitation in Jesus' name.
Amen.